I'm excited about our passages. Let's jump into them. Luke 6, 12. It says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called a zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, in light of what we have been studying in here, I want to draw your attention to something, and uh, maybe it stood out when you read it, but notice this. It says, he called his disciples... And chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Now, I'm going to ask you a little simple question. How many disciples did he have? More than 12. Right? He had more than 12 disciples. Um, The gospel gives us a peek into Jesus calling some of his disciples. And so we know how he called Peter, and we know about James and John, some of these people, right? But when you stop and consider, not even half of those that he called, that he made apostles, do we even know their calling? We don't know the moment in which they became his disciple. We don't know if if they were like some of the other ones who's, who he said, follow me, and they followed him, or whether they just lit in behind him because they saw the teachings, they saw the, the power of God in his life, we don't know. But what we do know is we need to get rid of this image that Jesus had 12 disciples. He had lots of disciples, 12 of them he made apostles, okay? <clears throat> the listing of the apostles is significant because they were sort of chosen out of a group, just like we have elders that have been chosen out of this group. We have deacons that have been chosen out of this group. But everybody in this room is called to be a disciple. Some disciples are chosen to do certain things, but you're called by God to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we define that as what? Not only coming to him, but becoming like him and then doing what he did. That's what we call a disciple. And you're called to be a disciple. I'm called to be one. What I find interesting is that after Judas' betrayal, we read this in Acts chapter 1, verse 21. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was called just, also called Justice, a guy with three names, all right, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, I share that with you because I want you to see that even when it came time to find another apostle, that they share with us right here in the scriptures that there were a lot of people who went in and out from among the the time in the life of Jesus. There was a larger group so that they could even turn around and go, we need somebody that's been here since, since John's baptism, who's seen his miracles, who sat under his teaching, somebody that's also a witness of the resurrection, somebody's going to take his place. And there was two guys that stood out immediately that they said, you know, Lord, one of these has got to be the replacement for Judas. I want you to process this. He chose 12 that he would put in the position of being an apostle. And much of what they do, we will never know. I mean, when you read Acts, it doesn't chronicle very much of their lives. We see quite a bit of Peter. And we see a little bit, you know, of, of John and James. But, but mostly then it takes off and it's about Paul. We don't know what Bartholomew 
did. We don't know what Simon the Zealot did. Now, history gives us some things about how they went to countries and, and they did ministry and all that. But the reality of it is, is we don't really know what all these people did. And to that same degree, I would say we don't even know what all, who all these people were. We just know that out of them, he selected 12 to be apostles. <clears throat> And I share this with you because I think sometimes you look and you say, well, you know, pastor's talking about being a disciple, being a disciple, being a disciple. But I can't be a, I can't be a Peter. I mean, I, I couldn't step in the roles of James and John or any of those. Good news, you don't have to. They were selected for very particular jobs. Like maybe a missionary has a calling to go to Africa or to go to Germany. Or like a person has a calling to be a minister and to go plant a church someplace. There are, there are definite callings that certain people have. But everybody's called to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. You are called by virtue of the fact that you know who Jesus is. Your calling is not to be forgiven of your sins. Your calling is to follow him. Step one is forgiveness of sins, asking him to be Lord of your life. But then you're called to follow after him. Most of the disciples, we will never know by name. We will never know all of the things that they did. But we know they're there because the scripture keeps alluding to them. And, and I want you to see this. We know that Jesus sent out the 12, right, in twos. He sent them out. We read it in Luke 9, verse 1. It says, and he called the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now, folks, that's pretty powerful. You stop and think about it. He literally gave them authority, his authority, to go out and do the very things that what? He did, which I established that point. For you to understand that when we get into Acts and, and the Holy Spirit is given to the church, it's to help us do the things that Jesus did. But I want you to take note of this. They go out and they literally, just like Christ, are laying hands on the sick and people are being healed. They are casting out devils just like Jesus did. And then what's fascinating is we get to Luke chapter 10 and he sends out 72. And verse 1 says, After this the Lord appointed 72 others. I don't know why. It doesn't say, and he, and, and he called the rest of his disciples. And he sent them out. I don't know, but it, it gives us this. 72 others. And he sent them on ahead of him, two by two, in every town and place where he himself was about to go. And I feel it's a necessity to drop all the way down and, and include what he gave in the instructions to the 72. Verse 9 says, here's their instructions. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come to you. The kingdom of God has come to you. He has the 12. He has the 72. In every situation, it's, it's he gives them authority. He commissions them to go do something and they go out there. Listen, 72 anonymous believers, 72 unknown people, and yet they go out sent by the Lord and they lay hands on the sick and people are healed. They preach the good news of Jesus Christ and people are, are receptive to it and their lives are changed. Please hear me. If God appoints you to do something, he will anoint you to do it, okay? What I want you to get into your hearts and heads is this, that you have been appointed to be a representative of Jesus Christ. And when he, when he appoints you to do something, he anoints you with the ability to do it. He doesn't just say, you need to go into your workspace that you may think is just one step above hell, but you need to go in there and you need to be my witness. You need to be my light among them. And you might at times want to walk away at the end of the day and go, 
man, I, don't, I, I, I can barely stand to be in this place. But that's where you're sent right now. Not just to punch, punch a clock, collect a check, but to be a witness there. You're his disciple, and he has appointed you to be light in a dark place. And some of you, you got a tough assignment because you're in a dark, dark, dark place. But you got to be the light there and shine. Anyway, what I want you to see is this, is that I believe Jesus empowers his disciples to minister. And just like he did the 12 and just like he did the 72 that we don't know by name, he has called us to be a disciple. And the responsibility as a disciple is to go forth and to spread that the kingdom of God is here. That Jesus Christ is wonderful. That he has the power to transform lives. That's what we are here to do. Uh, my point in reading all of this is to give you a clear picture that... You, Jesus didn't walk around with just 12 guys. Not all of them were there all the time, but there was a lot of disciples, a lot of believers, a lot of people who sat under his teaching and followed after him in different capacities. And we're going to see the different capacities right here. <clears throat> he has an interesting cast of characters that are following him. If you were a rabbi during that time, you wanted a few elite people that would be a great representation of you someplace else when they begin to spread the teachings of Christ that they learned from me, okay? Jesus, his invitation was to everybody. I think I had this in your notes, but it was, Jesus let anyone who wanted to be with him become like him and do what he did join his group. Anyone. He started it off by picking some people that nobody else would have picked. But not only did he select some of those, he began to gather people who, who wanted to learn his ways, who wanted to be with him, who, who wanted to be a representative of him when it was time, like the 72. Now, look at Luke 8. I'm going as fast as I can. But I'm not skipping anything, so. Luke 8, verse 1. Look what it says. It says, soon afterward... He went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also, are you with me? And also, some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had, been, had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. So Herod is going to play a pivotal part in the crucifixion of Jesus and the rejection of letting him be free and whatever, and yet his household manager's wife is supporting the ministry of Jesus. And Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. I guarantee there was not another rabbi during the time of Jesus that was walking around that not only had disciples that were men, but had women who were a part of the group on a regular basis and, and I always say to you, you can minister the best out of your scars. And I can only imagine how effective Mary Magdalene was as a minister of the good news of Christ when she could say, if you could have seen what I was and the bondage that I was in and the torment that I was in and what God did, what an effective ministry. And I see Christ welcoming them, going, yes, you've got a story to tell. It needs to be told. But these women, they were part of the support right there. I want you to get something because I think this is important. Ministry requires money. It does. And there are some disciples who basically their ability is to be able to pay for ministry to happen. And I want you to, to consider something that I think is very important. When God has blessed you with the ability to gain wealth, to manage money wisely, when you begin to understand that you have been given that ability, not just for yourself, but for the kingdom, to advance the kingdom, 
to allow the ministry of the kingdom to take place in different places, you need to understand that's part of your discipleship. That's part of how you serve the Lord and follow and do the things that you can do for the Lord. So anyway, but I, after you see that part of it and that there was people that came and were part of the discipleship bunch and some of them were there to just be a blessing and to be a financial help in it, there's this three words, this phrase, and many others. Folks, I don't know if you're getting this, but we, we visualize Jesus in 12, but there was lots of people that were following him. Lots of people that were learning his ways and becoming like him. Luke 24, we're now getting close to the end. Jesus is, has, has been crucified. Uh, two men are on their way to Emmaus. And then they have a revelation that the person they've been traveling with is Jesus Christ, right? They're pretty cranked up and they want to go back and tell everybody. So we pick it up in verse 24, Luke 24, verse 33. And it says, and they rose from that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. Now, I want to tell you, I want to say thank you, Luke, for adding those who were with them that were gathered together. When you read that account it, it, in, a, in one of the other passages, it sounds, or one of the other Gospels, it, it sounds like it was just the 11. But Luke, who was a historian, who was very interested in the details, adds this in there. He goes, no, it wasn't just them. It was a bunch of other people in that room. Because there was a lot of people, folks, who had put their faith in him, who had listened to his instructions, who had been a part of doing ministry with him that was excited and concerned. Is he resurrected? Is he alive? And they rejoiced and needed to be a part of that who saw that. So I want you to begin to see something. And that is this this group of disciples that we are called to be is not a calling. Well, you know, if you're not a Paul, you're not a disciple. If you're not a James, you're not a disciple. There are more that we don't know by name than there are that we do know by name. And so I'm comforted because guess what? The Lord knows your name. And if you're his disciple, he's called you to do things for him and for his kingdom that no one else may know and no one else has that same responsibility but you do and it's only you that's important to him right now because you're his disciple after the resurrection first corinthians 15 6 you don't have to go there i'm just going to make a remark to it but it tells us that jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time now i want you to put that in perspective more than 500 brothers do you understand the terminology of brothers as it's used in the bible first of all it doesn't mean just guys okay it's it's because it was a predominant man's world it it means the family of god so brothers includes the sisters hi you sisters you're part of the brothers 500 of them more than 500 of them that were what? Brothers, they were part of the family of God. They were part of, of that intimacy of knowing Jesus and living for Jesus. <clears throat> Romans eight twenty nine. Again, you don't have to go there. I'm just making reference to it. Bible tells us that it was God's will that through Jesus Christ that believers would be conformed which is also the same word used in other places, transform, that we would be conformed or transformed into what? Into the image of his dear son, into the image of Christ. That's what the brothers do. That's what the sisters do. If you're in this room and you're a genuine 
brother or sister, you are a genuine believer, you are a committed Christian, you are a follower of Christ, you are somebody that's trying to live your life on the basis of how he shows us to live our life, you are a brother and sister in Christ. And you know what the whole plan is? Real simple. That you conform, be transformed into the image of Christ so that what we're trying to teach as disciples is that you're not just coming to him, which is where we have stopped it at. You just come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. No, we become like him. We are conformed, transformed into his image so that we are like him. And that's what every disciple is supposed to be. Come. The firstborn of many brothers. And that's us. There are times when we look in the scripture and we see very clearly that Jesus is investing in the 12. Okay? The Lord's Supper is pretty much him with just the 12 as he is pouring into them. Because this is, this is his final hours and he pours into them. And we see times when, when not even all the 12 get to be a part. He's just got the three. Just the three to get to go in there and see the miraculous raise to life of that little girl. Just the three to get to go up on top of the mountain and see that transfiguration where Christ is, is, is once again revealed in his full glory and beauty. <clears throat> there are times when the Lord's doing something with this group and the Lord's doing something with that group. But I want you to be reminded of something. After the 72 anonymous disciples of Jesus Christ were sent out, the power of God flowed through them and they laid hands on the sick and the sick were healed. They preached Christ. We read these words. Jesus says, Luke 10, 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Folks, he says that at the, when the 72 return. I don't know how many times we take stuff like that and we say, well, that's, that's, that's in regard to the disciples. No, that's in regard to the believers. And here's what's beautiful. Four verses later it says, then turning to the disciples, he said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. And I don't know how many times it's been easy to go, well, he just directed that statement to the 12. Did he? The 72 saw what the 12 saw. So in essence, you got 84 people that probably heard him say, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. And I say to you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, blessed are your eyes for what you're going to see when you start truly stepping into the role of being the follower who's becoming like Jesus so that you have the ability to do the things that Jesus did. Because, folks, I'm telling you, the world needs to see the Jesus of the New Testament. They need to see the Christ who's all-powerful, the Christ who transforms lives, the Christ that can do in a moment what the best books and counseling can't do over years. All right, so let me wrap it up. If you are my brother and sister in Christ, you are a fellow disciple of Jesus. God bless you. And like the 72, like the uh, many others, those who are with them, the more than 500, you are the ones that have been given the instructions by the power of the Holy Spirit, now given to the church in Acts. You are the ones invited by God to go and be his witness. You're not in Jerusalem. You're not in Judea. But you are in the uttermost parts. And you're his disciple and whom he has appointed, he anoints 
with the ability to do. You have the power of God upon your life to pray and see a miracle. You have the power of Jesus Christ to speak light over darkness, to speak the testimony of the resurrection and how he transformed your life and how he can transform them. You have that as a disciple of Jesus because you were called, just like they were, to be with him, become like him, and do what he did. And I pray that you'll see that and rise up and say, I'm ready to start doing what he did because my world needs it.